I'm Joseph Nganem. I am the executive director for Heal International Relief Foundation. I was born in Sierra Leone and uh, Africa Faith and Justice Network has been an incredible organization that I've been honored to know and to meet Stephen. So without much ado, let us start with the with the event. So we're going to welcome our board members in and Stephen is going to play a beautiful procession song that was played for the Pope when he went to, I believe Zimbabwe, right? Mozambique, in Mozambique. So Stephen. So we're going to welcome Sister Ngechi Iwoha. She's the board chair and poor handmaids of Jesus Christ. We'll welcome Maura Brown, Vice Chair, Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, Bill Christie, Board Chair, Secretary, and Jemima Andan, who's the Board Treasurer. If you don't mind, um, we heard that um, recently AFGN lost a board member. So if you don't mind standing just for a minute of silence as we respect their life and all they did for us. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Mm -hmm. There we go. That was the executive team. Charles, Father Charles Brown, Bartholomew Bazemo, Margaret Doyle, Sister Margaret is here, Rufino, Ezama, George Kintiba, Father Ebuka Mba Nude, Arlene Peterson, and I know Faustine walked in, and again we give love and prayers to Albito who passed away recently. Sister Florence, we save the best for the last. <laughs> so now we're going to start with a beautiful prayer time by our board members, led by Father Baz, Jemima Faustine, and Sister Peg. So I'm going to pray in Gurunshi, a language spoken in Burkina Faso in the northern part of Ghana. Iyi bono ande chene chubal. Nere muda yo zadere. Nufu bina shena chimsi EFGN ne jimu. Nuwa nanye. Nyeshira yal ndana ba binana ne miwe enyela na choro bebe buju ekura nde bebe bosin eji kenke muwe nara chena bana pubula china ila ching bagako bol pol no wonne Ndano surane, ane chili, inyele dwa bebe kana nda bala baga koila. Che li bebe, be chili, nsumerio, bebe sura, ndo wujo. Mwiniga, nijji kenken EFGN, nijal mwila. Nara lwa lame mbichinu Yesu Krista yili yila. 
Um, Amen. I will pray in Kiswahili. E mungu mwema wanema. Tukusanyika hapa kuadhimisha miaka arobaini ya AFJN. Tuwaja kwako na mioyo ya shukrani. Tunakushukuru kwa uongozi wa roho mtakatifu kwa miaka hii yote. Tunakushukuru kwa wale wote waliopata maono kuanzisha AFJN. Tunakushukuru kwa wote wanaofanya kazi bila kuchoka kutimiza lengo la AFJN. Tunakushukuru kwa wafadhili wote wanaosaidia AFJN katika mabara mawili. Tujalie uangalifu kusikia roho wako anapotuita. Utupe hekima na bidii tunapoendeleza kazi ya AFJN. We pray to the Lord. I'll pray in Dagari, which is a dialect in the Upper West region of Ghana. Now I'm going to sing piano dana za Tilan Lache Zine, an African Faith and Justice Network, inga Tigiri Yonzale za inga. To win ane sikri mahu. For four no son dana, akuti. A yoniza poem. A neng baneza anta tear home a coup. African Faith and Justice Network inga. A neng baneza anson ka ayela aga numbi tore yella ma hom. A neng baneza anson ka na mwene yele aga tore. Son tiza zini yo tiswe ninti sikiri. Aninti te yang, te sing, te nang, chere, nimbili, song. Song, pogba, anen daba, neza, an song, ka yela, anye ma, ma hon. Yo te sikie, ka chere, ne, te yelbera, nimbera, uo. Kuti yang, anen fanga, a chere, a yelibri, Fonan kuti ne karega huo. Ati chere ne African Faith and Justice Network inga. Tupuore ana ayi fodana Yesu Krista yuor inga. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Good and gracious God, we gather here today to celebrate 40 years of the Africa Faith and Justice Network. We come with grateful hearts for your spirit's guidance during these many years, for those who had the vision that led to Africa Faith and Justice Network, for all who work tirelessly now to bring this vision alive, and for all who support this ministry on two continents. Bless all of us here today, open our hearts and minds as we listen to our early founders, to those who will offer possibilities and challenges, and to those men and women at work in the field right now. Let us be attentive to what you are stirring in our hearts and give us the wisdom and passion to continue this vital work of AFJN. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let me do a shout out to the 40th anniversary sponsors, especially Ujama sponsors, the Kamboni Missionaries and Society of the Holy Child, Jesus. Don't forget, as you see at the back of the room, there are some beautiful African uh, art, clothes, accessories. Do not leave tonight without going to the auction, signing up in the auction. You can do that through your app and then bid. 
as you know, all the funds go to AFJN. And of course, you're going to walk away with a great deal. So I think, Stephen, are you ready? Yes. Thank you so much, Josephine. And um, thank you. And, um, you know, Sister Nkechi's profile is so good that, that I had to really make sure that I put it up. I didn't want to have it in my head. So I'm sorry for that little breach in um, technical stuff. So it is my honor to introduce the, the, the board chair for Africa Faith and Justice Network, um, Sister Nkechi Owoha. She's a Nigerian, and she's a member of the American province of the Congregation of the Poor Handmaids of Jesus Christ. Um, in October 2002, she, Sister Nkechi was elected as chair of the board of directors. She's on the, she was on the provincial leadership of her congregation. She has a legal and social education background. Prior to joining PHJC, Sister Nkechi walked among the Sidon people of Ethiopia in Eastern Africa. She authored two books, Worn Out Shoes of St. Katharina, a symbol of transformation, and the interconnectedness between African proverbs and, and Christianity. Sister Nkechi obtained her doctorate degree from Walden University, Minnesota and U USA. She studied criminal justice with a concentration in law and public policy. She is also an adjunct professor at Calmet College of St. Joseph in, in Wheaton, Indiana, where she teaches ethics and criminal justice and, and introduction to corrections. And she's a very wonderful board chair, and I've been, it's been my pleasure working with her for the past two years, a year and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, I will welcome Sister Nkechi, who will officially open this. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Steve Nabiu, for that uh, kind words. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Honoring our invitation, I know you could be somewhere else doing something or even resting on this Saturday morning, but you chose to be here with us. God bless you. Um, and of course, we know that uh, faith is at the heart of this journey, uh, which our brothers and sisters from here in America uh, began 40 years ago, and we give thanks uh, for their dedication and commitment and thought for Africa. So I would like to welcome all priests, uh, religious men and women, uh, fellow partners, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am honored to have this opportunity and privilege uh, to offer some words to you on this days as we gather to celebrate 40 years of working on a cause that lies at the very heart of our humanity. I am deeply moved by the commitment and dedication that each one of you bring to our mission to be of compassionate service and tireless advocacy for and with Africa. We celebrate 40 years of AFJN's mission, driven by the inspired teachings of the gospel and guided by the principles of Catholic social teaching. We stand together to educate and advocate for just relations with Africa partnering with the African people in their pursuit for justice, faith, peace, and integrity of creation. We celebrate the wisdom and commitment of 38 American congregations of priests and religious who found out 40 years ago that only direct service wasn't cutting it. And so they began AFJN to engage in systemic change. Imagine a world where every child is allowed to blossom freely, where justice prevails, and where the well being of our communities is a shared priority. At the core of our work lie three pillars the promotion of faith, just governance, and restorative justice under the umbrella of care of creation. These principles guide us as we work tirelessly to empower communities, foster youth development, and champion the rights of women and the less privileged in Africa. Today, I would like 
to share with you a brief story that resonates deeply with our mission. It is a story of transformation, resilience, and hope. In many parts of Africa, the practice of child and early marriage has held young lives captive for far too long. We have witnessed how the innocence of childhood is shattered as children are forced into marriages, denying them the right to education and the opportunity to dream. But change is possible, and it begins with our commitment. Through our engagement, advocacy, and partnerships, we are seeing the landscape shift. Communities that once denied the urgency of this issue are now embracing change. Families are choosing education over early marriage and children are yearning to return to school. Husbands are advocating for their child children brides to have a better future. Women are speaking up for women on issues of domestic violence and trafficking and other forms of exploitation. One such story comes from a community where a chief invited AFJN to address the entire village. Through these efforts, their mindset transformed from denial to acceptance. Now, this chief stands as a, as a beacon of change, implementing measures to protect children and ensuring that any child sent out of the community must first gain the chief's approval. Catholic sisters, the true embodiment of selfless service, have joined hands with us in this journey. Their influence reaches deep into communities, fostering a change in mindset and a desire for learning. Together, we are witnessing actions being taken, collaborations being strengthened, and families being empowered. We continue to advocate for just relations between Africa and the US, and we continue to record successes on the issue of land grabbing by multinationals in collusion with some corrupt African leaders. But our mission is far from being completed. We are called to continue this journey of transformation to foster the growth of faith among peoples of Africa and beyond, to stand beside those who still face injustice and to amplify the voices of those who have been silenced for far too long. As we move forward, let us remember the impact we can make when we unite for a just cause. Your support, your dedication, and your contributions are the driving force behind our successes. Together, we can ensure that every child's dreams are nurtured, that women and the marginalized, the less privileged are empowered, and that justice is sought, sustained, and prevails. Receive all the gratitude from all of us on the board and the staff of AFJN for being part of this journey. Together, we are forging a brighter future for Africa, one where the gospel's teachings and Catholic social teaching are not just words, but a lived reality. May our shared commitments continue to inspire change and bring about a more just and equitable world. May our God, the God of our ancestors, continue to guide us and be with each and every one of, your, uh, one of you. Thank you for all for honoring the, our invitation and being here. Enjoy the rest of the day and lots of activities that we have prepared for your edification. Thank you, God bless, and the God of ancestors protect each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister. 
We are now going to go to our panel discussion. AFJN at 40, a conversation with AFJN elders. For 40 years, well, elders is more of a sign of respect. I think Stephen didn't mean he meant the wise ones, right, Stephen? <laughs> For 40 years, AFJN has addressed major issues impacting Africa while expanding its presence and impact in Africa. Former leaders and board members reflect on AFJN's journey, offering inspiration on how to further advance the well being of Africans and promote U.S.-Africa relations. Father Rocco, who I know worked in Sierra Leone, I was born in Sierra Leone, is going to be your moderator. Good morning, everyone. And again, to those uh, online, welcome as well to this uh, wonderful event. My name is Father Rocco Popolo, as was introduced, and I had been in Sierra Leone. To my left is Sister Mara Brown, and to her left is Father Julian. Father Bill Headley will be joining us, I think. Nope. Uh, he may be coming online. Uh, he was unable to come here in person. We meet, we hope this is an informal thing, uh, even in terms of introductions, just in view of time, since we were running a little late. Our bios are in the back of the booklet uh, for all four of us, so you're welcome to kind of peruse those if you'd like to know more about each of us. <clears throat> Our time together is really meant as a walk through these 40 years in a very synthetic kind of way, um, just touching on highlights. We've come a long way in these 40 years. We came from an experience some 500, you know how vast Africa is, so 500 missionaries is really a drop in the bucket. Most of the American missionaries were going to Latin America or to Asia. So Africa in our church then, and I have to say even now, is still a very vast unknown. But the leaders of some of the communities in the early 80s, responding to the very first synod of bishops after Vatican II that was focused on justice and peace, came to realize that, yes, work isn't enough. We have to go into advocacy and action. So Africa Faith and Justice was born. And Father Bill Headley was the provincial of the Holy Ghost Fathers at the time, and he was one of those movers and shakers, and we hope that he does, he's able to come online to give us his um, musings of those beginnings. Today, you'll notice there's a big change, um, particularly in membership. <clears throat> it's not just made of US missionaries who worked in Africa, but even just by the representation on our board that you saw this morning, more than half of the board is from Africa. Many members are from Africa. And as you'll hear at the end of our panel, the new um, outreach that AFJN has been doing since 2012 really allows AFJN to mentor and coach religious, African religious, as well as diocesan personnel on the ground uh, in terms of advocacy and justice. As far as institutional membership, back in the day, probably by the late 80s, we had up to 79 institutional members. Many of the communities, provinces, uh, were supporting AFJN. You'll see in your booklet now that our institutional membership is only about 31, 32. And I'll talk in my portion of our panel about how that change happened. But again, the big trend change is that we're no longer just taking the stories from our African missioners from the US. 
here to Washington and advocating at the UN or Congress or the National Security Council or State Department, but we're actually in Africa itself. Part of that is because of our presence as AFJN at the two African synods. Back in 1995, Sister Mara was there. She's the only, she wrote the only book in English on that uh, Africa Synod. I was present for the one in 2008. I was the only English-speaking blogger. Uh, we had a yesafricamatters.org blog. But from that synod really was launched the relationships with many of the different dioceses and communities that then in 2012, the staff and board were able to engage in in a very particular way. So this is our 40 years. So in the absence of Father Bill Headley, I'm going to invite Sister Mara then to uh, give some of her sharings, uh, some of her anecdotal stories from the beginnings, because she was with us not only in the beginnings, but she's still with us now. Thank you. Sister Mara. Cool. Thank you, Father Rocco. You can hear me all right. Is better? All right. Um, well, now that I have to step in the shoes of Father Bill Headley, those are big shoes to step into. Um, AFJN, well, 40 years ago, as Rocco said, the first in annual gathering I went to, I looked out at faces of all missionaries, white missionaries. There wasn't an African among us. Today, it's very good to see a great mixture of both. And so much has changed since then. <clears throat> Back in um, 1985, um, 83, excuse me, pardon me. Um, it was October of 83, I believe, AFJN was founded. I was still up in Boston studying in law school, but um, I arrived here in 80, December of 84. So I was not around for the very beginning days, but I did hear a lot about them. And Father Julian probably knew more about them. Did you? Yes, I think he can even help fill us in a bit more. But AFJN, you know, the spirit was working after Vatican II in the um, Justice and Peace Synod. Ju justice was constituent of the gospel and part of every Christian life. And it was working in different ways. And um, here in Washington, we had three men religious congregations where the provincials got together. We had the... Um, missionaries of Africa and the Spiritans and these SMA missionaries. And the three provincials are the ones who had the idea of AFJN. And they gathered at a mission Congress, the various, various congregations to form AFJN. So that I think in the beginning, when I first came on board, we were probably about 25. And uh, by the time Father Ted Hayden left six years later, we were pretty close to 50. And the numbers built up and have fluctuated over the years. But they wrote, they were very academic. They came from different backgrounds. Um, we had sociologists among them and anthropologists. And um, they wrote a very detailed booklet and detailed ideas on what this organization should be. At the same time, I'm studying in law school, having been in Kenya for 12 years and trying to put things together. And my ideas were pretty much the same as what they were thinking of, but we didn't know. As I say, the spirit was well working at that time. And AFJN was formed basically at the um, Mission Congress, and somebody can fill in more on this later. And then... Um, the first office was set up, I believe, in April of 1984. And um, Father Chef Jaundice was brought from Africa. He had been working in Kenya at the University of Nairobi, very, very popular among the missionaries there and the Africans and everybody else. Everybody knew Father Jaundice, Father Joseph Jaundice. We called him Chef for um, because that was his name to us, Father Chef Jaundice. And he was brought by his provincial to Washington to um, become the first 
official executive director of AFJN. But from October 1983 to April of 1984, Father Ted Hayden was the acting director, and he set up the office. He, we um, we had two rooms um, built in with the um, United States Catholic Mission Association. We were very closely connected with them in one way at that time, and we had the two rooms there. And Father Father Ted Hayden and Chef Jaunders were two very, very different people. Those of you who know him, know them, would know they're very different. And I think that is part of the blessing of AFJN getting started. Ted Hayden was um, believed very, very much in advocacy. He was, a Jew, he was a doer. He was forever writing letters. He was forever Congress. He was around meeting people, networking. Whereas Chef Jaunders was a writer, philosopher. He he wrote several books while he was at AFJN. And um he 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 didn't believe in he didn't believe in lobbying. In fact he thought it was corrupt in a way. And so um there were times so then I came then I came on board um in December of nineteen eighty four. And by the time I came on board, Chef Jaunders was in as the executive director officially in one of the rooms at AFJN. And I was in the second room with Suzanne Langer, who was the secretary at the time, um, as the associate director. And Chef D uh, Ted Hayden had moved two blocks away to set up the um, SMA Justice and Peace Office. And he had brought along a lot of the AFJN stationery with him. So sometimes I'm wondering, do we have two executive directors simultaneously or consecutively? <laughs> it was a very interesting time. Um, the first year when I came on board like that, we had worked, um, oh, the brochure had very strong um, words and it was very direct. And we had, we followed, we did research, analysis, education, or um, yeah, education, let's say, and followed by ad. And I would say that Chef John just fulfilled the first part very, very well. He, we did the research and the analysis. And Chef did the education through a very, very colorful newsletter. He took great pride in his newsletter, had great graphics in there to get the point across very well. And it was a very popular newsletter. By the time Ted came on, we we're too busy to do a newsletter. Why do a newsletter? Until the board got down on us and said, you have to do a newsletter. So then we did a simple one. But at that time, <clears throat> we had to figure out the issues, not only the process, but the issues. And um, the so we worked closely with organizations that were around. One of the words in the brochure was, we were to be non-duplicatory which meant we were not to be doing direct work on South Africa because there's another office, the Washington Office on Africa that did that. But our job was to supplement that and provide people there for advocacy and so forth and to work with them, but we were not to do the original work. And then we worked closely with Bread for the World at the time because we needed to learn how to do advocacy. We had been missionaries hadn't been in Washington at all. So we'd had to learn the ropes on how to do that. And every year at the annual gathering, the membership would have lessons in advocacy, followed by doing lobbying or advocacy the day afterwards. So we learned our advocacy there. But then um, together with Bill Rao from, who was at Bread for the World at the time, AFJN, published its first two books. Um, first one, Feast to Famine, which was on food security, and followed by the second one, Africa's Food Crisis, Which Way Out? And so uh, food security was perhaps our first issue, a big issue at the time, and it still is an issue today. You know, one thing at the time, back in the 1980s, 
we thought that by 1990, AFJ would be closed down and all of Africans' problems would be taken care of because we were going to be able to take care of everything. Well, look at us today. <clears throat> we're still working and hopefully going for another 40 or more years because there's more to do and we have new people to do it, which is wonderful. And not only that, but we have the Africans themselves advocating for themselves. Whereas we did the best we could with what we had, but we were not we were not able to speak for our people. We were able to speak about. Now we have people who can speak for because we are speaking. So there's a big difference right now and a big challenge out there also. So then the next issue that we dealt with was um, refugees. Cy Smith, Simon Smith from Boston was a Jesuit and he was over at the Jesuit office and we worked closely with the Jesuits. And the next book that came out was Refugees Are People, written by Chef John. You remember that book? Then um, at the time, <clears throat> the center of concern was right, right up the street and across the street a bit from us. And the center of concern, we had Father Pete Henrio there and we worked very closely with Pete Henrio on the African debt and economic issues. And um, again, we're still working on economic issues today. So the issues from the very beginning are still with us today, perhaps changed a little bit, but we still have the same um, issues. And um, Pete Henrio, at one of our first annual meetings was the speaker. We did a lot of education at our annual meetings. We brought bishops from Africa, we brought people in. Um, Pete Henrio, um, his first talk he gave was the poor pay twice, talking about these debt and the economic justice. So during Ted's time, um, pardon me, during Chef's time, not only that, but we did the education and the communication, research the analysis and the education communication and networking. Ted did a lot, pardon me, Chef, I'm getting the names mixed up. Chef did a lot of networking with Africa, where we come from, and um, connected us with um, Sayer and um, the um, bishops' conferences in Africa and um, the various groups he was with there. Plus, he did a lot of networking with Europe because the original plan had been that there'd be one Africa Faith and Justice Network that covered Europe and the, United, and the United States. And that's why they brought in a European to be the executive director and an American to be the associate director so that both continents would be involved. Am I giving somebody else's talk here? <laughs> Am I? Hmm? No, okay. Am I finished? Am I, am I, done? I think five more minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. And so um, <clears throat> at the time also, there was a big debate in AFJN. Should the office be in Washington or should it be in New York? Because which do we need to influence more? The United Nations or the US Congress? So we had an office at the UN and um, we shared it with Pax Christi International. And so we never got to hire the person for that office, but far be it from us to leave the office undone Every Thursday, I was on the train at six o'clock in the morning up to the UN, met up with Mary Beth Rise and a school sister of Notre Dame who worked, worked at the UN full time, um, went out, did, did my business at the UN, then was on the train at night, got home maybe about eight or nine o'clock at night and back into the office on Friday morning. And that was very, very helpful to us at the time because it gave us the global vision along with the local USA vision, which helped us keep our message pretty balanced. So that was Chef Jaundis. Then after three years, he went to teach at Washington Theological College and Ted Hayden became the executive director. And I said, Ted came in, he was really very active. He was the person for the time. Ted was very, very good at building up the finances of the organization. You know, we needed money to run this. And Ted built up the membership 
and he left us in very, very good financial standing, which kept us going for some time. So Ted's talents were very, very different from chefs, but both were what we really needed at the time. And in many ways, it was good. They were both working simultaneously at the same time, even though I didn't always know who I was working with, you know. Um, and then we began to work um, peace. Peace was a big issue. Liberia came on. Um, Ezekiel Pajbu came into the office. We did a lot of work on Liberia. We, did, we continued to work on anti-apartheid because Ted was very, very much involved. I think he was vice president of the Washington office on Africa, which was working on apartheid. So we did a lot. Food security continued along. Sister Frederica Jacob, one of our sisters of Notre Dame, came on. She was sick, so she spent half time in Washington, the other half in Africa. And um, we sent her to Africa one time to set up an AFJN in Nairobi with a computer. That was all we could give her. Well, she set up. they set up an office there with the, the Jesuits, missionaries of Africa, a whole group of congregations. And it became People for Peace in Africa, which is still working and has done a lot of work on Sudan and the Horn of Africa. And then when she'd be back in this country, you would have her, um, her working here. And we had a Sudan working group, a Horn of Africa working group, which connected with John Prendergast at the Center of Concern, who was really in our backyard at the time. And at that time, you would see most of the taxi drives in Washington were from Somalia. So at night, you'd see taxi cabs parked all around our offices as they were in there doing their newsletter and so forth. So they were exciting times, those early days, as we we're trying to get AFJN established. And gradually, we had more and more Africans coming on board. And then, of course, um, we collaborated with Church World Service, the Mennonites, we sent out many, many action alerts. We visited Congress. And um, of course, then the African Synod was a big part of our work. And by then, I was getting, at the, after the African Synod, um, 19, April 1994 was a significant year for Africa. You had the African Synod. You had the first elections, um, free elections in South Africa. And you had the Rwandan genocide all three of which brought a big era, brought a big sea change in Africa and in the Africa Faith and Justice Network also because our direction changed. Well, it didn't change, but there was much more to be done. And I think I might have exhausted my time. Yeah, but closely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. Father Bill would like to add to that beginnings, those beginning, any anecdotal stories or uh, what caused you as provincials to really want to start this? Um, welcome, Bill. Thank you, Rocco. I'm sorry, uh, there was a misunderstanding about the timing. I thought it was at 11 o'clock. Uh, thanks, Myra. That was just a great presentation, and I very much appreciated it. Some of it I had certainly forgotten over a period of time, and some of it I never knew because I wasn't there in the office. Uh, I was one of the three provincials I think is known now by history, uh, uh, what was called then the White Fathers, now I guess the Missionaries of Africa, if I understand it right. Uh, uh, Father Hegel was there, and then of course Ted uh, from the SMAs and myself. Uh, I, I would say what, what motivated us, Rocco, was uh, it, it was kind of in the air. Um, we were all turning uh, to our communities and had a sense that we could do more than uh, run our own uh, provinces, so to speak. And we had obligations outside of ourselves. Outside of ourselves, it was sort of in the wind, uh, the justice and peace uh, enterprise. Uh, we took a lot of motivation uh, from the uh, Conference of Major Superiors. I'm sure Myra would go on about the, the women. but uh, In this interval, uh, I'd also like to invite people online, if they have any questions, or if those of you here in the room have questions, there will be a, a moment when we can entertain those. Uh, I'm hoping that'll happen. So um, people online, you can chat your question in and Lydia will then communicate that to us. 
Will those of you in the room just write down your question and we'll, we'll entertain that. So in the meantime, I'm going to hand the mic over to Father Julian from the Missionaries of Africa uh, for his input. Hmm. So I am uh, Julian. Julien. Uh, you can uh, read my resume uh, in the booklet. And I, as they say in America, I am humbled and honored to be <laughs> in the same group age as Sister Maura. <laughs> the same age group as Sister Maura. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rocco sent me a question. What is the importance of AFGN to our missionary society, the Society of Missionaries of Africa? What are the issues important to the missionaries of Africa? Our answer from uh, Jeff Donders to Barthélemy Badzemo, our answer is everything <laughs> that is good for the Africans, I mean Africans, not only Africa as a general uh, philosophical uh, continent, but the real Africans, everything that is good for the Africans is good for the Society of Missionaries of Africa. Myself, I have studied theology from 1962 to 60, uh, basic theology, not something big. Uh, theology from 1962 to 66. And we, in those days, we never studied so much the Bible. It was Theology, it was the dogmas of the fourth century. But it was terrible for mission, I, uh, I must say, to become a missionary, to study the dogmas that we would have to translate or not translate in African language and teach to the Africans. This was in the mind of the time. I'm telling you not only my story, but the story of our missionary society. But during those four years, 62 to 66, what was happening? Second Vatican Council. And during those years, from newspaper, from conferences, not in our classrooms, but from outside, we discovered that the Holy Spirit was not a ghost. You see, Holy Ghost. But a fire burning in the heart of the people, even before a missionary set foot in mission land, in foreign land, the Holy Spirit was there. This was the big discovery. We discovered also that we were not called to preach with words. And I did it, of course. But to live the message of Jesus, the fresh message of Jesus, as spoken in the first century, that all are welcome into the kingdom of the Father. Of course, we made big mistakes learning that. We learned from our mistakes. We learned to what to say, what to do, and especially what not to do as missionaries. We learn discernment under 
the Holy Spirit. We started, Lord, as I was a young missionary, learning the local languages, first to speak, and then we discovered that we learned the language to listen to the people. This was quite a revolution. Mostly in my first day in Africa, that was in Burundi, I was quite able to speak uh, Kirundi language. Next, we were 30 kilometers uh, south of uh, Rwanda. It was uh, about the same language, Kirundi, Kenya, Rwanda. Only the specialists would see uh, some differences. In those days, uh, 66 to 85, I learned the language in order to speak, to teach. But then I was sent, and uh, most of the people were Catholics. The vast majority of the people were Catholics. We had almost no Protestants and no Muslims in our surrounding. Then I was sent to Niger Republic. Some say Niger, some say Niger. CNN now says Niger. Republic <clears throat> from 85 to 2003. There I learned basic Hausa language. And I was with Muslims. I think I had to learn to listen. The language that is very important to a missionary, but the language in order to listen to the people. That is quite different. During all those years, we learned big words, new attitudes that came into our vocabulary and counter dialogue, development. You see, you see the big encyclicals from the Pope, the development and peace, independence emancipation of the people, peace and development, social analysis. Oh, that came a little bit after my ordination later. Promotion of local culture, good governance. And then we come to the latest of the, the trends, the women empowerment and land grabbing. You see, this come into our mission slowly in order to apply the, the teaching and the life of Jesus. What would Jesus do? What is the, what motivates us and what drives us under the Holy Spirit to be missionaries? Of course, missionary is not a good word that we don't use it in Algeria, we don't use it in Jerusalem, we don't use it, <laughs> we are the, over there, we are still the white fathers and it's better. And in other countries, like in America, especially in the United States, uh, white father is a very bad name. So we have no name. We try to be disciples of Jesus <laughs> and our common names, but uh, we are the heirs of our ancestors, those who, who founded us. About 30 years ago, I heard about AFGN. I think it was the time of uh, Jeff Donders, of course, and uh, Bill Moroni visiting the United States. Oh, there is uh, something like AFGN. 15 years ago, through uh, Jean Robitaille, I met Rocco. Executive director, I think you were. And he came to visit us, 1640 21st Street, our house in Washington. And it was not only for money. Not only. <laughs> yeah. Then Anyedi came. And we had, as a superior general in Rome, a Dagari. I heard a prayer in Dagari a few moments ago. 
uh, Dagari, uh, our uh, beloved uh, confrere Richard, who became cardinal and who died last year, he was our superior general. And he met Rocco, he met Agnieszki. He was very much interested in this kind of mission for us in the United States. He's the one who went to Africa to, to take out of Africa, Barthélemy, Barthélemy, and to bring him to Washington. Barthélemy in those days was uh, already had a, a master in uh, political science from Ikima College, uh, the U Jesuit University in Nairobi. And as you know him, he was well prepared to become here. But then Anyeji, who had one, two, three PhD, Anyeji told him, hey, when you go to the executive office, look around the table. It's not uh, for the sake of studying and having a title, but all of them are PhD and they know what each other know around the table. You have to be on the same level, not to make big introduction, just to say, so Anyedi sent him, I mean, suggested that he, he would go to get his PhD in political science. And now look at the result. We want to America to know about Africa, United States. And now Barthélemy is teaching at Georgetown University to future diplomats. He says mass in the church where uh, uh, sometimes Biden and uh, Bl Blinken, what is the name, Secretary of State, Blinken goes, <laughs> go. And so we this is the work of Africa Faith in Justice Network is proclamation of about Africa. So I greet uh, <laughs> Bahatia. Where was he? He was not here early. Oh, cool. So this is our story with uh, AFGN. Then came a time where many missionary uh, uh, institutes, even among the founding members, were thinking of letting go AFGN, lack of personnel, lack of money. Mora spoke about that a little and also. The missionaries of Africa, I think, because of our superiors uh, and the one in Rome, uh, Richard Bauer, we never had the idea to let down Africa Faith and Justice Network. And at the same time, I want to stress this, we never had the idea to take over. This was the danger. Other society would say, oh, missionaries of Africa will take, it's a good thing, AFGN, but no. That's why we never offered them to have an office in our house. This would have been too much to put under the complete umbrella of the missionaries of Africa. So we maintained from the beginning, and with Barthélemy, uh, this was very clear, that Africa Fete Justice is a network. And Often we reminded Anyeji, and now I remind uh, dear Stephen um, Rogers, that they have to keep contact with the Institute Missionary uh, Congregations and keep contact with the, you see, enlarge the network like it is now but keep contact with the founding members and all the others who have been, Mora said about 50 congregations were part of it. Keep contact so that the network would represent really uh, the ideas and uh, uh, of the founders. In the footstep yeah. of uh, all our members who work here, maybe I will miss some, but Jeff Donders, John Lynch, 
Uh, yeah. uh, Larry Goodwin, uh, Phil Reed, Bill Dyer, some left our society, but when they worked here, they were part of us, and some uh, have gone to heaven. Thanks to Rocco, Agnedi, Bartelemi, Bahati, Ukaria, Faustin, those I have known, uh, Florence, who have launched AFGN into this 21st century with antennas in Africa. We are motivated by our faith and we work for justice. We are preoccupied with what is going on in the Congo, the RC, Nigeria and Ghana, in Sudan, in the Sahel, Mali, Niger, where I was, Burkina, where uh, uh, Barthélemy is from. There, we are friends. Uh, Malian priest writing to me this morning. Uh, uh, a doctor from Congo, a med MD from Congo, writing to me this morning. is in an hospital where they, every day they have wounded persons coming from the massacres of the M23. We are linked to Africa and we want to build bridges, not walls, to promote peace, not war. Congratulations to the new director, Stephen Rogers, Nabiru Rogers. Congratulations to our sisters from Maura to Ukaria and Jemima. In the spirit of the Synod, we are still talking among ourselves. What do you talk about on your way? Let us continue to talk to each other. Let us listen to each other. But surely, let us continue to walk the talk. This is also an American expression. We never knew, used that in Canada. But to walk the talk, I like that. To walk the talk about the justice of God that is not similar to the justice of man. Uh, read the parable of the uh, prodigal son. The justice of God is completely different from the justice of man as presented by the elder brother, who is not happy with the justice of God. But we are to work for the justice of God for the African people. And we do it with our faith in God and in the African people. It's because of our faith in God, we try to have the same look as God has on the African people in order to work according to thy will be done, thy kingdom come. Not our kingdom, not our justice, but the justice of God. So happy 40th anniversary to AFGN and many more to come. Amen. Thank you, Julian. Uh, we do have a connection with Father Headley. I appreciate the history background that Myra has given, it's very rich, uh, as well as the sense of dedication that Father referenced. Um, I think my question really was, or from you, was what was our early inspiration? Can you hear me okay? Not really, but... Um, well, I what can I do that. more? Go ahead. Uh, okay, well, I I'll, I'll deal with the inspiration question a little bit. I think it was 1984, uh, the Vatican II was filtering down to us, I believe. We had some early groups that were a source of inspiration to us. Uh, certainly, Mary and our fathers developed, and sisters had developed a, a methodology for examination 
uh, of uh, difficult situations. Uh, we also uh, were touched by uh, the center of concern that Myra was uh, kind enough to mention. We also got inspiration from the Conference of Major Superiors of Men. And that's, I think, where we came together. Uh, there was a justice and peace group there. It was in the air, so to speak. Uh, we went with them to uh, Chile uh, to, to witness in the Pinochet time. We uh, established an office on Haiti, uh, working out of Washington. Uh, there were a lot of exciting things happening that time. And we came to the realization that uh, we had things in common as mission communities that sent men and work with their men in Africa. And I think that that gave the, the early inspiration for this. Uh, Myra put it well. Uh, Ted was certainly an inspirational person. I think I was the titular head during that time, but it didn't matter. We were doing everything uh, collaboratively. I was on a trip to our men in Africa that I interviewed Chef and uh, uh, persuaded him to come and to be our first executive director. Um, perhaps as I'm trying to rush toward an end, Rocco, to save you time, uh, I, I want to, to, to say that uh, I, I left the program rather early. I finished my provincial term in 94 and went on to work with the Cy Smith that was spoken of and the Jesuit Refugee Service uh, for a refugee project in Africa. I'm a sociologist by training, and they wanted someone with that background. But then I went on to Rome. In Rome, I found another people uh, like myself from the communities uh, that were working at the general level. And they had heard about AFJN, and I'm sure were in contact with Myra and uh, um, uh, Ted at that time. And they wanted to establish one in Europe. Now, Myra has already spoken about the one at the UN and even one in Nairobi. This would have been one for Europe. And that became established. I, I had the great privilege of, of being uh, involved very much in that. And we set it up in Brussels. And it's still existing today. I had always wished it was a little closer collaboration, but uh, they're working and doing the same sort of thing we're doing in, in a very good way. Uh, let me stop there, Rocco. Uh, I can certainly handle questions as others might. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very, very much. Bill reminded me there's one thread through all of what we've been saying, and the word is collaboration. Whether it was collaboration among the missionary communities in the early 80s that founded AFJN, or the collaboration that now we are enjoying with many of the congregations on the continent uh, that are really helping many of our programs. So uh, it's been a real strength from the very, very beginning. No one of us can do it alone. Um, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm not going to give my input uh, until after questions. So are there any questions in our audience here or have there been questions on chat? No, no questions on chat? Any questions here? Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, is there a European AFJN that yes. we're connected with or we separate? Is there? Well, that's what uh, Bill was just mentioning. Okay. Uh, I think two, when did it start? About two years after us? Yeah. yeah so well, it's yes. It's network because it's housed in Brussels, but almost every European capital has a network and they all connect to that. But their, their focus is more on documentation, not so much on advocacy, but they were founded much like us to actually influence the European Union. That's why they're in Brussels. So, uh, and they're still in existence. Okay, thank um, but you. they don't do the kind of advocacy that we were doing here. We have worked collaboratively with them. 
when they were founded, um, we worked very closely with we. In fact, um, for many years, I would go to their annual meeting every year. When we did our, um, our program in Nairobi a few years ago about land grabs, they collaborated with us. They were part of it. And they are still doing land grab work, more of the documented side, as um, Rocco said. They, they set themselves up slightly differently. Um, the one good thing they have is their funding comes from the superior generals of the congregations. Okay. So they tax the congregations for a certain amount of money. So they don't have the fundraising problem that we can have at times. But um, we, I don't know how much they work together right now. Steve would have to answer that. But I know there has been over the years. Uh, certain, certainly AFJN. Oh. Certainly, AFJN was uh, was an inspiration for them. I was there and, and had a chance to broker that. But they certainly looked to you with certain pride and, and uh, sense of collaboration, too. So what Bill was saying was AFJN here in Washington was the inspiration for Europe to start. Mike. Get the mic. Uh, Elizabeth. The mic for Mike. <laughs> uh, the question I have is, uh, how was AFJN doing currently financially? That I couldn't tell you. Uh, I think I think there'll be reports sometime in the course of the meeting, no? Or I'm not quite sure. Without, without going more specifically into that, because I haven't looked at it, the finance this morning. Um, I think I, I still remember the way Rocco describes AFJ and it says we have been resilient and for 40 years where every day we believe that next year we might not be around and 40 years we are here. We are actually much better today than we were when we were founded. So just to answer your question, we have been um, financially resi resilient and um, we are getting there. Thank you. So one, one anecdotal story uh, in the, from the beginnings, I guess it was begun on a Sunday. Uh, Tom, Tom Tunney uh, shared, a, shared this once with his confrere, Chris, Chris Promis, who was the board chair, and we were in very financial straits back in the, I think it was 2008 or 2009. And uh, actually at a board meeting, there was a resolution to, resolve, to dissolve because it was just that and Tom sat there and said, you know, folks, we were started on a on a Sunday, and by Thursday we were in financial trouble. And here we are, 35 years later. Push on. So we, we survived that crisis, and we continue to. So I'm glad to hear that um, we're doing okay. Elizabeth, yes. Oh, yes. Did, what, what's your question? Did she chat a question or? Oh. So she probably wants to talk. It might be easier to put the question on chat, Elizabeth. Try talking, but if you can't. Oh, she must have. She's not muted. Elizabeth, if you wanted to talk, you can try. Sorry. Nope. It looks like you're muted. It's weird. Oh, no. Yeah, sorry, we can't hear you. So, Elizabeth, please put your question in the chat. <laughs> Meanwhile, oh, yes, there's a question way in the back. Okay, and my name is uh, Father Bartholomew. My question is uh, about, um, okay. right from the beginning, what was the relationship of uh, AFGN with the local church, I mean, especially the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. Uh, 
I don't recall any any um, relationship with the Archdiocese of Washington D.C. What I do recall um, locally was um, for while well, the Bishops' Conference was on Massachusetts Avenue, which was probably the first six years or so. Every first Friday, all the Catholic organizations um, that were in Washington D.C. used to gather at the Bishops' Conference. It was organized between Network and the Bishops' Conference, and the staffs of all those organizations would go. We would have a happy hour, and we'd sit in a circle, and we would all exchange what was going on in our organization and see how we could support one another. So anybody who was um, an organization at that time um, would was invited to participate. It used to be very, very lively. When they moved to where they are now, up on 4th Street, we had one meeting there, and it was difficult getting through the security at that time. And after that, we didn't have any more meetings. So that organization kind of died out. But um, I don't recall any direct connections with them. What we did have for some time was um, we um, AFJN on many occasions would meet in the chapel of Our Lady um, of Africa over the National Shrine. And the crypt of the National Shrine became a place for people to meet very often, like when bishops came and so forth. The local, the Africans would come like from Congo, Sudan, when the various bishops would be here. And a, a lot of that was arranged. One of the priests, that, one of the mission hearse people had a connection with the shrine at that time. And the crypt of the shrine became a very special place for us. But direct connection with the archdiocese, we do have our 501c3 through the archdiocese. So we are connected through them that way, but that's about it. I don't know if anybody else has anything else. No, I. Uh, this is Bill speaking. I, I agree with you. There was no formal connection or even informal connection for that matter. Did Elizabeth's question come through? Oh, I see. Okay, great. And there's one other... What did it get? She, uh, Elizabeth is in Vienna. Pax Christi's headquarters are in Brussels. That's true. The, the international headquarters of Pax Christi and, and Elizabeth has contacts. I know when I was director, I, did, um, I didn't join Pax Christi until I actually went to Massachusetts, but we did do a lot uh, with um, Pax Christi, and they were interested in some of the advocacy issues that we were uh, engaged in. So... There's another question way, way in the back. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, let me stand up. Good morning, everyone. And uh, congratulations, Abe, Jane, at your 40. Uh, Sister Mora, in your presentation, you expressed uh, surprise. Um, Okonkwo Remedius, my beach here. Sorry about that. Do you remember things fall apart? So okay. that's that's the name. Okonkwo Remedius Mabichie is my name. I am from Nigeria. I'm from the southeastern part known as Biafra, if you remember that. So I I have engaged with Bahati a number of times. Um I've been fascinated by this AFGN. And uh, I have always had a question he's he has not been able to answer. And uh, Sister Mora, right, uh, you did hint on that a little bit. You have been doing this. Uh, AFGN has been here for 40 years. You expressed surprise that uh, some of the problems uh, that led to the initiation of AFGN is still with us. Hunger, poverty, uh, injustice, uh, uh, women disempowerment, men disempowerment, and all that. We are still dealing with all that, maybe into the next 40 years. And I am wondering if at any time in the history of FGN, you had a big question, 
Why is that the case? Have you had an answer to that? Thank you. We have thought about it many, many times. <clears throat> and in fact, um, when I first went to AFJN um, in 1985, it was I was invited um, to Liberia to um, meet with the um, bishop there and at the time of the crisis there. And all of a sudden, I got an invitation through our sisters in Nigeria that at that time, Bishop John Oniakin from the um, Diocese of Aluren, where our sisters were, wanted to talk with me. He had been reading some of the articles we were sending out on third world debt and the economic crisis, and he wanted to come and have me listen to him and his analysis of what was going on at the time. He later became cardinal, and he talked about Nigeria, and uh, which, of course, meant the whole of Africa, and he explained the difference that most of Nigeria's debt was commercial debt, whereas the others were to the World Bank and the IMF, and he explained the difference. And um, then we have thought many, many times about the causes, how you get at the causes and how we deal with the causes is, is the big problem which we've been working on. And so right from the beginning, the, it was the bishops in Africa who were interested in making sure we could hear at least from them. And at that time, I went to his office and he had all, all poor people outside waiting to get some help and so forth. And he was meeting with everybody so that we we did we have thought many, many, many times and we've connected with other organizations and a lot of work has gone into it, but we are still hungry. And as long as we have greedy people in the world, we might still have hungry people too. You know, it boils down to that. Our time is almost up. In fact, in a minute it will be, but I'd like to take a, just a, two minutes to share some things that I think are important. <clears throat> One thing we haven't talked about is some of the collaborative uh, engagements that AFJN has not only been part of, but in some places initiated. Uh, we have been the chair, I'm not sure if they still do it now, of the Catholic Task Force on Africa. So we started that, Maura started that when she was director, and it was a monthly meeting of all the different Catholic agencies or agents in Washington, again, to listen to what the issues are. Again, not every group had to deal with the issue. Sometimes we could learn from one another. Again, collaboration. Uh, that was an important piece. We've also been part of the Ecumenical Advocacy Days every year. We chair the Africa Tract. Uh, that's, a, that's a collaborative um, advocacy uh, conference uh, it's a lot of work, but it actually makes a big impact. We'll have a thousand people present each weekend to, again, go to Congress to uh, meet with their representatives or their senators on particular issues. Um, we've grandfathered two groups. Uh, when I first became director back in 2006, I would go, as Mara was mentioning, to many of these meetings in the uh, city. And I was struck when I would go to the Great Lakes Forum because I noticed that the moderators, the facilitators, never acknowledged the Africans from Congo in that meeting, month after month after month. So we, together with uh, World Vision, uh, IRC, CARE, Bread for the World, we founded the Congo Global Action. It didn't last a long time, but it was a organization that allowed the Congolese to speak for the issues of Congo. So that we and we were the um, we were the ones that made it legitimate AFJN. Also, when I first became director, uh, we had some university students from Notre Dame. It was a wonderful example of how a university teacher could engage students on African affairs. And the Holy Cross Fathers, who work in Uganda, had students who went to Uganda. They formed an Ugandan uh, action program. Two of those students came to Washington after graduation, and one was hired by us, uh, Michael Poffenberger, but he and another student from Notre Dame founded what became Resolve Uganda. And again, we grandfathered them into existence. 
So AFJN has been really important uh, for those kind of collaborative efforts that, again, widen the influence. As small as we are, we are not insignificant, and we're really important for the city when it comes to Africa. When African bishops come to the, to the states to appeal and help ask for help or justice issues, very often they prefer to come to AFJN, at least when I was director, and I'm not sure about when Anietti and Steve but they would come and ask us to accompany them to the Hill because we would allow them to speak of their issues. Many of the other groups that do welcome them and accompany them will then, in the course of that five or 10 minute meeting, talk about their issues. And the African bishop said, you all allow us to speak our truth to power. And we appreciate that. Uh, so I found that a very important uh, work that AFJN did. Every director, you know, picks up to pieces as they find it. I think when I was director, we we dealt with healthcare issues because PEPFAR was really important and Congress was going to threaten to decrease some of the funding for President Bush's initiative. We tried to maintain that. AFRICOM was begun during the time I was in Washington and we were one of the first to object to Africa. Africa did not need to be militarized by our forces. We didn't succeed in stopping AFRICOM, but we did succeed in reducing the amount that Congress would give to it. Uh, we also were engaged in uh, restorative justice, and we did some research on the continent in view of a book that has yet to be put together, but restorative justice was begun as an issue at the time. And then, uh, because I had been in Sierra Leone and we had 15,000 child soldiers in Sierra Leone and I was victimized by that personally, uh, we, we addressed the issue of child soldiers. Because when I came back in 99, there were 22 wars on the continent. No one know, knew that. When 10,000 people died in Sierra Leone that January 6th of 2000, we were on page five of the New York Times only. More people died in Freetown than our September 11th tragedy. But no one knows about that. So the whole issue of child soldiers was something that we really tried to advocate for. And lastly, we began the whole issue of land grabbing and advocating for that. And thank God today, AFJN is still engaged on the continent with sisters and other church workers on this horrible issue of land grabbing. So I hope this uh, excursion over these 40 years has helped you see in a little way uh, where we've come from and where we're going. We're in great hands and um, um, congratulations on our happy 40th. Thank you. <laughs>